and welcome to a new edition of our program Africa Today. In this uh, edition of the program, we will talk uh, about uh, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement as leaders from Africa's uh, private and public sector will meet in Kigali, Rwanda for the second edition of the Business Forum of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, 54 out of 55 uh, African Union member countries have signed up to the deal. Here is the full story. Africa is home to the world's largest free trade agreement in terms of number of countries, territory and population. 54 of 55 African Union member countries have signed up to the African Continental Free Trade Area AFCFTA. The deal covers a market of 1.3 billion people and a combined GDP of $3.4 trillion. It aims to boost economic growth, intra-African trade and investment across the continent. But although it was established in February 2020, implementing the agreement has been slow. According to the Economic Commission for Africa, African countries continue to trade with the rest of the world more than among themselves. Inadequate infrastructure, a lack of finance and weak governance are often to blame. This week, leaders from Africa's private and public sector will meet in Kigali, Rwanda, for Biashara Africa, the second edition of the AFCFTA Business Forum, to discuss the challenges and opportunities of the free trade area. Secretary General of the AFCFTA made statements about how to overcome the hurdles. He said the deal was established in the middle of COVID-19 in February 2020. The following month, March 2020, is when the entire continent of Africa shut down, as he said. Closure of borders, closure of airports, everything that is an instrument for trade was shut down. He said that for the first time, six to nine months of the year, it was extremely difficult to get anything done. He says, now we have concluded all the protocols of the agreement, in other words, the legal construct, including very difficult areas such as digital trade, rules of origin of local content, for textiles and clothing, for the automotive sector, creating a dispute settlement mechanism for an entire content of 47 countries trading under the EFCFTA. He said all protocols have been concluded of the agreement, in other words, in the legal construct. He said this includes very difficult areas such as digital trade, that's to say rules of origin of local textiles and clothing for the automotive sector, creating a dispute settlement mechanism for an entire continent of 47 countries trading under the AFCFTA. And now we are joined over the phone by Ambassador Gamal Bayoumi, former Assistant Foreign Minister. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. How are you? Good. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador, how would you describe the importance of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement for the African economies, especially at such global economic challenges? Very important. And maybe you have heard uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Badr yes. Abdul Hati, he was talking with the Prime Minister, telling that the future is Africa for us. And we started seriously uh, years ago with a sub-regional group, which is the Comesa countries. It's 21 countries on the uh, east and south of Africa. And since that time, our trade with those 21 countries was tripled. Now, since the presidency of the President uh, Abdel Fattah sisi he proposed to combine the three sub-regional African uh, free trade areas in one big free trade area. This will be the, the, the largest free trade area in the world uh, concerning the, the number of population. It is 1,200 million inhabitants. And uh, uh, most of the African countries already signed and ratified this agreement. And I, I think, as you rightly said, that our uh, trade with, with the whole African uh, countries union, they, 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 it, it will be tripled or even more, because there is big chance in Africa for more and more trade. But what I draw the attention also when I talk to our minister, that investment is very important, because Africa uh, uh, has uh, to, to, to call us on investing more and more. And 
and Africa is in a very bad situation vis-à-vis -vis the other continents. Uh, although it is the poorest continent, the flow of money going out of Africa is much more than the flow of money coming in because it pays its uh, debts, it pays its invoice of imports more than it receives of investment or the result of its exports. So we have to change this for the sake of Africa and the African countries and the African people. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, according to Economic Commission for Africa, African countries continue to trade with the rest of the world more than among themselves due to inadequate infrastructure, lack of finance, and weak governance. How would you elaborate on that? Yes, uh, uh, of course we, 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 com we are complaining about this situation, but also we have a heavy homework to be done. Our infrastructure is, is, is in great need to uh, be ameliorated. Our bureaucracy is very bad. Our banking system needs to be uh, ameliorated, and uh, many things have to be changed. The transport system also, our ports in Africa cannot receive big or mammoth ships. This has to be changed. And there, is, there isn't roads uh, and uh, ways of communication between the African countries. We have to do this homework, uh, and then we, we shall be able to call more and more for foreign direct investment. And also the Egyptian initiative was to call on the donor countries in order to invest in Africa with the Egyptian experience, which is the best and the cheapest in cost, on the African soil, and we had a, a, a very positive uh, answer from China, from Japan, and from the European Union. But still we have to work more until this initiative can be realized in, in, in fact. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador, also, how is Africa uh, proceeding with regards to the implementation of the protocols for the African Continental Free Trade Agreement? We, uh, I, I think we have to be very careful because, as I told you, the bureaucracy and some people who are uh, against the idea of free trade area because they benefit from the local market much more than they benefit from uh, the African market. So uh, we have to uh, put an eye on, 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 on these areas where they resist the Africa free trade area, and we have to deal with this challenge until we get a more and more flexible situation in order to gather more and more people benefiting from the, the idea of free trade areas. Because there are people, and we have to confess that there are people who are not uh, in favor of freeing the trade because they benefit from their local market and they don't want to compete with foreigners in, the, uh, in their own land. And how do you see the role of the private sector in enhancing economic cooperation? This is very important and I, I am glad that whenever our president is seeing his counterpart, he is accompanying with him uh, some uh, businessmen from Egypt and on the other side from other countries, we see that there are businessmen there. And because a businessman and a, a private sector community, they know the situation, they can give us ideas, they can complain about the problems and the obstacles against free trade. So private sector is very important. But still I see honestly that there is a sort of resistance to the, the private sector. And some uh, a good uh, portion of our think tank uh, is still living in the time when the government was investing by itself. And I want this to be repeated, that the government should be the sole investor. This we have to advocate against it. Our mass media has uh, a, a big responsibility to change these ideas. 
And I hope this will be changed and gladly that our president, our prime minister and the foreign minister, all of them are talking about the role of the private sector. So, Mr. Ambassador, Egypt uh, reports uh, suggest that Egypt is well placed to benefit from and help advance the agreement. How can Egypt help in advancing uh, such an agreement? I can tell you honestly that we are the most representing country in Africa. We have uh, an embassy and ambassador in every single uh, country in Africa. And we have a very good reputation in Africa because of the old history. Some African countries are proud that there, there are some tribes coming from a pharaonic time. Uh, still, they, 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 they like the, the time of Gamal Abdel Nasser and his counterpart during the liberalization process. So they look to Egypt as a, 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 the, the big brother. And we are, uh, as ambassador in Africa, I was treated... Uh, according to a royal uh, uh, status. So uh, we, we, we don't have any problem against our presence in Africa, and we have to make use of this, and they, they, they trust us, and I think we have a, a good deal of work to be uh, done in Africa in order to give our experience. And as you will know, we have the Egyptian Fund for uh, Economic uh, cooperation in Africa, and now we are asking uh, to uh, triple the, the capital of this fund. It became an agency for development in Africa, and we, 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 we need more and more in, uh, capital to invest in Africa. And uh, the lesson I got, got from my work in Africa is that if you want to trade with Africa, you have to invest in Africa in order to establish small companies to cut wood, because the wood in Africa is very cheap, but you cannot buy it unless you go and cut it yourself and uh, transport it yourself. Uh, to, to establish canned food industries, those small uh, uh, industries do not need uh, big capital, but it needs big performance and big management. So. We are there, and I hope that we, we know uh, the way, and I, I, I am glad that our uh, leadership uh, is worried uh, about and uh, 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 know exactly what do we need to develop this situation. Yes, I'd like to thank you, Ambassador Gamal Bayoumi, former Assistant Foreign Minister. Thank you, sir, for being with us. And back to our reports from the African continent and in Zimbabwe. Uh, it has confirmed its first two cases of MPOX, uh, the Health Ministry reported the cases without specifying which variant had been recorded. More in the following report. Zimbabwe has confirmed its first two cases of impacts days after Zambia reported its first case. The cases whose variants have not been identified were detected in people who were from or had traveled to Tanzania and South Africa. The cases in Zimbabwe's capital Harare and in the southern town of Mberingwa were detected in a child who developed symptoms last month after traveling to South Africa and in a 24-year-old man who became ill after traveling to Tanzania. The health ministry did not identify which variants been recorded. Both patients are recovering and contact tracing is underway. Neighboring Zambia reported its first case last week without disclosing the strain. The World Health Organization declared Mpox a global public health emergency for the second time in two years in August, following an outbreak of the variant infection in the Democratic Republic of the Congo that has spread to neighboring countries. Nearly 30,000 suspected Mpox cases have been reported in Africa so far this year, most of them in Central but also in West Africa few cases reported in Europe and Asia. More than 800 people have died of the virus, which typically causes flu-like symptoms and pus-filled lesions. is usually mild, but it can be deadly, especially in children. And the uh, monsoon havoc is exposing West and Central Africa to rising flood risks with heavy rains, flooding Chad, Nigeria, Niger, and other countries. Details follow. 
few months, heavy rains have flooded every one of Chad's 23 provinces, burst a dam in northern Nigeria, damaged ancient buildings in Niger's desert town of Agadiz, and killed more than 1,460 people in the countries on the fringes of the Sahara, according to the UN. On one hand, there were annual rains flagged up in advance with forecasts of particularly heavy downpours, raising the question why officials were not better prepared. The UN aid agency, OCHA, said that if only the authorities could find a solution in advance so that every year it wasn't just water, water, water and floods. On the other, some of the inundations were not so predictable. Rains fell further north than usual, flooding desert areas that usually see little rainfall in Chad and elsewhere, exposing gapping holes in infrastructure and official preparedness plans. Africa's economic losses linked to floods have been rising. A report by the World Meteorological Organization, published in 2021, said they jumped to $12.5 billion in 2010 to 2019, more than double the average of the preceding three decades. And experts say there is worse to come. The Sahel is increasingly threatened by floods due to changes in natural climate patterns, greater rainfall intensity, poor urban planning and other causes. Well, dear viewers, uh, by that uh, we come to the end of uh, today's edition of Africa Today. Thank you for watching.